Welcome to Sunday evening Bible study. We're in Acts chapter 11, and you can follow along in your Bible. I will put the text upon the screen. We have covered this, we have covered the first 10 chapters of Acts, and there is a lot happened in the early church in these chapters. Now you can see that item one in tonight's chapter, chapter 11, has to do with Peter being charged in the Jerusalem church over associating with Gentiles. Well, that is an interesting story, and I'll get into it as best I can. But the scripture says that it was the circumcised believers who criticized Peter. And they said, and I've got the very quote from Acts in there, you went into the house of uncircumcised men and ate with them. And so I'm not sure exactly where they were going with that, but you can know that if Peter couldn't answer that well, that he was subject to some kind of a penalty or censure or something. I'm not sure exactly what it would have been, but that's what they said. And so Peter defends his actions that he took with the Gentiles. And that's what chapter 10 is all about. And so he tells them the story precisely, backed by six witnesses that he took with him on that journey and uh, in that event. And so he said and told them that God had acted through him, Peter, and had given the Gentiles the Holy Spirit. And Peter would have been opposing God to refuse. Well, that is a summary of what we're fixing to read. And so the conclusion of that is that the apostles and brothers in Jerusalem praise God for saving even the Gentiles. And there's much to be said about that statement, and I'll try some of it tonight. You can see next in chapter 11 that it talks about those brothers who were scattered by the persecution and how they spread the message only to Jews. And so I'll speak about that situation and why that was. And then, and that's supposed to be a three down there, not another two, that's Roman numeral three, there were certain of the brothers from Cyprus, or that is Kypros and Cyrena, which uh, would have been Kurena, went to Antioch and told it, that is the gospel story, to Greeks. And that is exactly what Peter is accused of in a sense. This business about entering in their house and eating with them is one of the rules that they hatched up to keep the bloodline of the sons of Abraham pure from heathen influence. And so that's, the church is gonna have to answer what Peter has done and when it says there that the apostles and brothers in Jerusalem praise God for saving even Gentiles. That is the official answer that the church had to give. And so here is chapter 11, verse one. Now in this, Peter is accused of entering a Gentile house and eating with them, which is a big deal. Oh, they couldn't allow that. And this action this accusation is not made just anywhere. It's made in the church, the only known church in the world, at Jerusalem, the only place 
where Jesus left them and where all the apostles were. That is the significance of where this accusation was made and what the action, what the accusation was and who it was made to. So, the first verse in chapter 11. The apostles and the believers throughout Judea heard that the Gentiles also had received the word of God. Well, that is given to you as a fact without a lot of explanation. Chapter 10 that we covered last week is the explanation. And I will refer to it as we go. I'm not going to quote a lot of it tonight. So, verse 2. So, when Peter went up to Jerusalem, the circumcised believers criticized him and said, you went into the house of uncircumcised men and ate with them. Starting from the beginning, Peter told them the whole story. Now, what do you, what do you see right here? You see that in chapter 10, Peter was at Joppa in the house of a man who had an unclean occupation as far as the Jews go, which is a place probably that they criticized Peter for staying in, but at least he was with a Jew there. The man was a, a tanner, a man who tanned hides, which was considered unclean, and he lived by the sea, and probably the reason he lived by the sea is so he could wash the hides in salt water, the sea water. So they heard that the Gentiles had also received the word of God and they blamed Peter with it and that's what the second verse is all about. Now, what happened in chapter 10 is that Peter probably, uh, according to the way that Luke tells this story, Peter, like the other apostles, had no idea of taking the gospel to Gentiles. I mean, they were uncircumcised people and they did not live up to the law. They were ignorant of the law. They were not the sons of Abraham, and the gospel was to them. So, when Peter went up to Jerusalem after what happened to him, and that is he got a vision from God, and basically the voice from God said, whatever God has told you is clean, don't you say that it's unclean. And that happened three times. And just as that vision shut down, there were three Gentiles knocking at Peter's door. And when he went down there, he found out that there was a centurion, one of the import, most important government officials at Caesarea, had had a vision from an angel and that they and one of them, by the way, it says, was a Roman soldier representing that centurion. And so that Roman soldier is knocking on Peter's door and saying that God has sent us here. And chapter 10 says that Peter had already been told by the vision, do not hesitate to go with those men. And Peter, he said, that he could not go against the word of God and so he invited them in the house and they stayed with him overnight and the next day Peter hit the road with them for Caesarea. Uh, I get, as I read the mileages, well it's calculated different it's according to whether you calculate it on a modern road or, or the, by the, as the crow flies or by the ship or as you wander around those trails. Well, as the crow flies, it's about 40 miles. And if you have to walk it by road, it might be 60 miles in their day. But anyway, it's, please understand that it's a, it's a journey. And so Peter is going with them, and it took more than one day. So he not only ate them with them one time, but he spent some nights with them also. And they charged him, you went into the house of uncircumcised men 
Well, when he got to Caesarea in chapter 10, the centurion answered the door. I take it that he did. I don't know who exactly answered the door, but I know when Peter stepped forward, the man prostrated himself down on the ground as if he were worshiping a king or a god, paying obeisance to a god. Now, what would have happened if Peter let that go on? Judas took on God's will against what Jesus told him. And what happened to Judas? Well, what saved Peter about that is that Peter could repent. And Peter could turn to the Lord. And Peter could obey the Lord. And when he told that man to get up, you can know that he learned his lesson about putting, you know, if you disagree with God and go against his will, you know what you've done? You have made yourself of more authority than God. There's a sense in which when you disobey God, and this is what sin is, and this is why it has, the, the, Paul wrote us that the wages of sin is death. And the reason that it's death is because it is treason against God. And when you sin, what you have done is, is what, what happened in the Garden of Eden. And that is, they disputed with God and God told them what they ought to do and they disobeyed. And Satan asked them, uh, are you going to believe God or are you going to believe your own logic and so forth? That argument has trapped mankind from that day till this. Mankind in his sin puts himself above God and disobeys. How can you say that God is God and disobey him? How can you do that? Well, the fact of the matter is that you had better ask forgiveness. And Peter, as over against Judas, Peter was a man who could repent. Peter could be changed. And when he told that man to get up from there, I'm not God, that's proof of the change. Hooray for Peter. Now, he asked them why they sent for him in chapter 10. And he started off that message like no other sermon I ever heard of. He more or less, I don't, I don't quite know how to say this. I probably should have put it back up here you can look this up in chapter 10. you got a Bible. But he started that sermon off by saying, Now all y'all know that I'm a Jew, and it's against the rules for me to be here in your house, right? Is that the way you start a sermon to a bunch of lost people? Well, anyway, that's the way this one happens. And so Cornelius was asked to explain what had happened, and he explained that God had sent an angel in a vision and he had obeyed the vision, and that's why Peter was standing there. And among the other things that he said was that we were told to listen to whatever you say. And so Peter then told them the gospel. Now, what is so astounding about that, as you read that, at least it is to me, that they, in Jerusalem, had laid down all these requirements on anyone that had to accept the Lord and be saved. You had to be a Jew. And who responded at Pentecost? Those were diaspora Jews or Grecian Jews. Remember the Grecian Jews? That's who came in the church at Pentecost. But they, I'm afraid that they came in as second class citizens because they were grew up in a foreign culture. They had foreign friends. They had been in foreigners' houses. They had eaten with foreigners. And they spoke a foreign enemy language. And the Jews had fought plenty of wars with the Greeks. That's one reason for the diaspora. The, the Greeks had scattered them by fighting them in wars. Well, 
So you went into the house of uncircumcised men and ate with them. Well, he sure did, but he did it because God intervened in his life and gave him a, a vision that he could not ignore. And to his credit, he put aside all that foolishness, and I'm calling it foolishness that they had laid down that Jesus did not lay down. You know, if we lay down rules that Jesus didn't lay down, we may be on pretty shaky ground. We might be in for a correction if we've got all these rules that Jesus didn't mean for us to have. And we, and we don't want some, I mean, how many denominational rules are there out there? You gotta get, you gotta do this to get into this church and you gotta do this to get into this church. I, I don't have a solution for all that. I'm just telling you it's there and always has been and it was in the first church that ever existed and here it is. So Peter, while he was yet speaking and before there was any ceremony by him, no laying on of the hands, no invitation him, no coming forward and asking for forgiveness. None of the things that we think are important happened. What happened is that while Peter was still speaking, these people got the Holy Spirit. Now, I'm not sure exactly what to make of that. Uh, there's various interpretations of what that would be, been, but whatever it was, it says that the circumcised believers that Peter brought with him, and there were six of them. He, uh, see, I've already laid it out to you that see, Peter went down there very cautiously. And the fact that he took six witnesses with him, and you're going to find out in this chapter that, he, that he's going to tell the, the church that's charging him with those charges that I've got these six witnesses and they saw all this, okay? Well, he covered himself when he went down there by taking six witnesses. Because he knew this was going to happen. What's happening here in chapter 11? Well, so the Gentiles received the word of God while Peter was talking without any laying on of the hands, without any ceremony, without any hoorah, without any recitations of any special words or any of that. And it says that Peter stopped what he was doing and said to the to the witnesses he brought with him. These people have received the Holy Spirit. What keeps them, what keeps us from baptizing them? That's exactly, I think I've told it about right. You can check me out in chapter 10. So, here we are at verse 3 in chapter 11. You went into the house of uncircumcised men and ate with them. Starting from the beginning, Peter told them the whole story. So here it comes. And so I've got these numbers here. The Gentiles received the word. The church heard about it. There were those in the church who wanted to charge Peter with violating the rules. And so the circum and, and Luke tells you who it was. And telling you who it was also tells you what it was over, what it was that they were really getting at. And that is, who had taken the gospel, as far as we know, to Caesarea? Y'all remember? Do y'all remember Philip, who took the gospel first outside Jerusalem to the Samaritans? And then he got back to Jerusalem and an angel came to Philip. And by the way, Philip is not an apostle, is he? I mean, we want to say that they were elected to wait on tables. What's this about Philip having a visitation from an angel? So you get down there in that desert and there's a man you need to meet. You go. You go. And he went. And it was, it was the treasurer of the Kandaki. Her name was not Candace as we think in our translations, she was the Kandaki, which is in effect is the queen of the Ethiopians. And this man was her number one man, the one that was in charge of her treasury. 
And I've told you that that chariot that he was in, he wasn't driving it. That man had a military escort with him front and rear on mounted animals, and he had escorts on that chariot exactly like the King of England does when at a coronation. And so it says that Philip ran along beside him and he was reading from Isaiah. Why, why did Philip know what he was reading from? Did I, y'all remember me telling you? The Septuagint is what he was reading from, which is a Greek version, I understand. I, I, what I mean is I understand he was reading from the Septuagint, but he may have been in the Hebrew. But whatever it is, all of that is written in such a way that the best way to understand it, since it it's not plain English, they re recite it out loud, and as you say it, it begins to make sense, more sense than just when you read a bunch of jumbled words. And so saying it out loud made sentences out of it. There was no punctuation, no capital letters, and so forth. So the man is doing what they all did in that day, and that is when they studied the scripture, they read it out loud. And so here comes Philip, and he can hear the man. And he asked him, do you understand what you're, what you're studying or reading? And the man says, how can I? And the Bible doesn't say that he stopped the chariot. It said, he says he gave an order to stop the chariot. Y'all get that? That man was in charge of a, of a retinue of people. So that chariot stopped and Philip gets in and they go on down the road and they come to a point and I'm gonna, I'm gonna get into that with a slide here in a minute. And so I need to go on. But this happened and Philip is the one that took the gospel to Caesarea after that. And that's really what I was getting at there. So this centurion that has come to Peter because an angel sent him might be another convert of Philip. Do y'all get the connection here? Verse five, this is Peter. I was in the city of Joppa praying and in a trance I saw a vision. I saw something like a large sheet being let down from heaven by its four corners. And it came down to where I was. I looked into it and saw four-footed animals of the earth, wild beasts, reptiles, and birds. Then I heard a voice telling me, get up, Peter, kill and eat. I replied, surely not, Lord, uh-oh. <laughs> Who can straighten out God? Who can straighten out the Lord? I mean, only a man that has been told all his life that the Lord forbids you to do that stuff would have uttered those words. You understand that he'd been taught nearly from birth that he couldn't do that. And really what he said is, and here it is, surely not, Lord, nothing impure or unclean has ever entered my mouth. Well, I know how he feels about that. I've lived that way in certain ways. So I know how important that is to maintain the standard. He said, I have never done this. And it's the Lord that's talking to him. Y'all understand the shock. Place yourself in his boots. I was in the city of Joppa praying. Well, Joppa is not in a place that's under the authority of the Sanhedrin or the Jerusalem church. Do y'all get it that this is down on the plain and the authority of the Sanhedrin over the Jews is up there in those hills? This is down here in old Philistia. And there's plenty of Jews down there now, but it's principally Gentiles. And this is the place where it says, you go back and read it after that conversion of that Ethiopian it says that Philip started out at Azotus and went all the way back to Caesarea spreading the gospel and so here it is and so I was in the city of Joppa and that's where Philip had carried the gospel 
old Philistia, not Judea. And he's staying with somebody that's got an unclean occupation. That's hard to explain, but there it is. And he says he was praying. And nobody can fault. The Jerusalem church cannot fault his praying. He was not out of line there. So this trance came on him and he saw a vision and this large sheep and all these creatures. And he heard this voice, get up, Peter, kill and eat. And he replied, surely not. That's ne I have never done that. The voice spoke from heaven a second time. Do not call anything impure that God has made clean. This happened three times. Well, you know, the Jews were big on numbers game. What is, what is the number three? Well, I think that I, I will translate it for you into, into English. It's God's phone number to them. The, and, and we call it the Trinity. You get it? There's, that's so three times. This happened three times and then it was pulled up to heaven again. Right then, now you get the right then significance. He's sitting there baffled. Why did I see this? And three men who have been sent to me from Caesarea stopped at the house where I was staying. Well, in other words, they knocked on his door right when that vision was pulled up to heaven. Quite a coincidence, wouldn't you say? You might say that there is no doubt that Peter had received a vision, and he better make sense out of it. And look at verse 12. The Spirit told me to have no hesitation about going with them. These six brothers also went with me, and we entered the man's house. Well, that doesn't give you some of the details that are in chapter 10 about those men explained themselves, and they talked about the centurion that had the vision, and Peter invited them in the house and kept them for the night. And this business about six brothers, that is interesting too. And I've already told you that Peter took them to be witnesses because he needed some witnesses when the Jerusalem church heard about this. Y'all understand that this is all outside the pale of the, I mean, the church that Peter is in has got rules against this. And there's only one of them that had a command from God to don't say what's unclean that God has said is clean. There's only one member of the Jerusalem church, one apostle, and that's all. And that's Peter. So he's, in a sense, he's by himself. So he takes six brothers, and that makes seven of them. Well, now that's an interesting number, isn't it? That's another one of those God numbers, seven. Well, so, so he says all that story, and so he's got these six witnesses. And the six witnesses entered the Gentile house and ate with the Gentiles just like Peter did. So in a sense, if they don't stand with Peter, they're in trouble too. Verse 13. He, that is the centurion, told us, how he had seen an angel appear in his house. Well, now I'll just stop there and make another comment. They are going to ream Peter out, if I may use colloquial English. They're going to get on Peter's back about entering the man's house. And the man is saying, yes, I'm an uncircumcised Gentile, and God's angel was in my house. Well, are the Jews going to say that an angel goes in this house, but we Jews are too good to do that? I mean, do you see the absurdity of some of this? I mean, Jude, uh, Luke is laying it on them, is he not? And by the way, how many, how many authors 
and the Bible were not Jews. One, Luke, who wrote Acts. This is not the writing of someone who was raised a Jew. And he is one of those that can see the error of it. And so he's showing you, and he's telling you that an angel, you know, there's an old saying about fools rush in where angels fear to tread. Well, the angels go where they're sent. And they were sent to that Gentile's house, and they talked to that man. The man. A Roman, not just a Gentile, a Roman, the most hated of all of them because they are the ones that have ruled us. And they tried to blame them with murdering Jesus, did they not? Well, the man's name is Cornelius. That is a, a Latin name. That is not even Greek. Well, He's a Roman centurion of the Italian cohort in Caesarea. Now, I can tell you from the name that there were by this time there were few cohorts that were actually Romans. And when you say that this is the Italian cohort, what are you saying? You're saying that these are the real, like like our soldiers? We got now soldiers from all over the world, I guess, in our army. But if there was a battalion that was made up of strictly old time Americans and they named themselves that, wouldn't somebody say that's special to the country? Well, these are the Italian cohort. And this man is a centurion. I, I just don't know how can Luke can tell you that this man is important why uh, I, I tried to I've, I've gone through that chapter about the conversion of Paul why did God go out of his way over Paul the answer is that there was no other man qualified in the world like Paul to do what he finally did he was the best man alive for God to call into that and so he went out of his way well who was this Cornelius well there's something about it that I can't explain but I know enough about it to know that it took 300 years for the church to change the empire enough that an emperor said that this church is the official church from now on and the day he did that, I say that he did it because his army was made up of leadership from the Christian church. Men like this, this man. Why is the New Testament so friendly to the centurions? Y'all ever run across a bad one yet? No, they were all spoken well of by the writers of the New Testament. And so this right here, you can know that this man in ways that we don't know and Luke didn't tell us how this man is important to the history of the church. And what Peter is doing here is also important to the history of the church in another way. Because this, is, this man is important to the Romans and Peter is important to the church. And the decision that he brings to the church in Jerusalem is important for the future of the Christian church. And if they hadn't made it, you'd have had to be a Jew to be a Christian and be saved. That's how important these events are to us today. So Peter said, now listen to this, verse 15. As I began to speak, does that tell you that they were not won over by some big address. Does it tell you that there was an invitation or a laying on the hands or the ceremony or secret words or anything? As I began to speak, the Holy Spirit came on them as he had come on us 
at the beginning. Well, at the beginning, what's he talking about? He's talking about what happened at Pentecost. And there was a hundred, was it 120 of them gathered together in, the, in that church? And the Holy Spirit came on every one of them. And every one of them walked out on the street speaking the language of someone from the diaspora. These Hellenistic Jews, well, the, the Grecian Jews are the ones that came in there and could hear all this in their native language from back home. That's who joined the church, 3,000 of them in one day. And you learn in the sixth chapter that these apostles didn't have time to see to it that their widows got fed. What? I mean, these, this is St. John and St. Peter. You mean they're human beings too? Well, okay. As Peter began to speak, the Holy Spirit came on them just as it did us. And this is Peter's word. Verse 16. Then, wait a minute, what does that mean? Does that mean he never thought of this before? It might. Then, I remembered what the Lord had said. Well, it's about time. John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Yep. It's time to remember that. It's time for us to remember that too. We kind of give people the idea that when we baptize them with water, we've washed them clean of everything, and that's it. And we even go so far as to tell them, once saved, always saved. I wonder what people that, are, that don't know what we're talking about, I wonder what they think we mean by that. So, if God gave them the same gift he gave us who believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I? Well, now that's remarkable. I mean, Judas made his mistake by trying to tell Jesus he knew more about the kingdom of God than Jesus did. And Jesus finally told him, that what you've got in your mind to do, go on and do it. And John says, and he left there and went out into the darkness. Y'all get that word darkness? Judas went out into the darkness when he violated Jesus' will and word. So if God gave them the same gift he gave us who believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I to think that I could stand in God's way? Peter had learned his lesson. When they heard this, they had no further objections and praised God saying, so then, even, the Gen even to Gentiles, God has granted repentance that leads to life. Well, there's more in that sentence than I can tell. And I can't prove what I'm about to say. But it looks like to me that that argument was not over at that point. And I'm going to show you what I mean. But probably what that means is that those that were willing to listen to Peter and the Lord praised God about it. And those who said, we've got these rules and we're going to enforce them, that became the circumcision party and it divided the church. We're going to come to it in Acts and I'm going to get into it right here now about how they never let loose of their resistance and the apostles, I just have to let the scripture speak for itself. Acts 11, 19. Now those who had been scattered by the persecution that broke out when Stephen was killed traveled as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus, and Antioch, spreading the word only among Jews. Well, there it is again. These folks that were scattered because of the dispute that Stephen had 
and and he wasn't in a Hebraic Jewish synagogue when Stephen was talking. He was in one of these Grecian synagogues. It's even named. It was the synagogue of the freedmen. And the freedmen probably were the sons of those Jews that had been captured by the Greeks and the Romans in those wars and hauled off and made slaves. And they had earned their way out of slavery and their sons were the freedmen. Do y'all get that? Got questions about that? These freedmen were required to come back to Jerusalem for these feasts, and so they're there. And Stephen speaks to them, and I can just almost imagine, well, I can't imagine. I can almost hear Stephen telling them, now you guys need to accept the gospel of Jesus Christ and carry it home to your people. Well, which people? Well, all of them. No, 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 no. We are going to spread the word only among Jews. Do you all see that? There it is in verse 19. Acts 8, 1. And Saul approved their killing him. On that day, now I've jumped back to Acts as you can see. On that day, a great persecution broke out against the church in Jerusalem and all, you'll see what I got underlined there? All except the apostles were scattered throughout Judea and Samaria. Well, now we've come to chapter 11, 19, and Luke's going to tell you about that. But he hadn't told you why the apostles weren't scattered. Why do you figure that is? I figured and the scholars I study and have, and have sat at their feet have taught me that the reason they weren't scattered is because they didn't make any trouble about the Gentiles. They just confined themselves to the Jews. And I'm going to show you the scripture to back up what I just now said, okay? I promise you it's coming. The apostles stayed in Jerusalem and the church around them stayed in Jerusalem. The ones that had to leave were the ones that Saul was after and that's these Greek speaking Jews that were going to spread the gospel to uncircumcised people. The apostles were Hebraic Jews from Galilee and they spoke Aramaic which is not the original Hebrew but it is the language of the exile. And who led the Jews back from the exile? Was it named Ezra? And did, wasn't Ezra, Ezra so strict that he told those fellas that those of you that weren't out there with us on the exile, you have married these wives that are not qualified and so you've got to divorce every one of them. You remember all that? That's the Jews that were on the exile and that's who the Sanhedrin is and that's who whipped the apostles and that's who ran, that's who put the apostle Paul, you see where it says in 8 1, and Saul approved the killing of him. It says that he stood there and they put their cloaks at his feet. And that means he was an official observer to make sure that they observed all of the law as they killed Stephen. Stephen wasn't just murdered, he was executed legally by stoning for blasphemy. Well, the Hebraic Jews were not advocating bringing the Gentiles into the church at this point. They were suggesting it, and it was getting them to it, and it was scaring these guys to death. The apostles were worshiping and teaching. Now, hear this. In this but you check Acts, and you, you asked me before this time in Acts, if, and, and until Peter went and, uh, well, when Philip went into uh, Samaria, they sent Peter and John down there and they saw something and went back and reported it. But that, that hadn't persuaded them. And now Peter has come checking on what Philip did down there in the flatlands, the coastland. And so he's at Joppa. And now he's gotten into this. And these folks were not yet really advocating bringing the Gentiles in. 
And it says, do you see in the 19th verse that they went as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus, and Antioch spreading the word only among the Jews. So that idea hadn't taken hold yet except with a small few. And this business about Peter put him in the know. Verse 20. Now here's where it happened. Some of them, just some of them, you understand not all of them, but some of them who were spreading the gospel all over the diaspora, but only to Jews, but some of them, and that word however, it shows that this is exceptional. It's rare. Not many. Some of them, however, men from Kipros and Turina went to Antioch, the capital of Syria, the third biggest city in the empire where the gospel needed to go. And they began to speak to Greeks. If they hadn't have done that, where would you be today? Think about it. They began to speak to Greeks also, telling them the good news about the Lord Jesus. Oh, they're in trouble now. This is uncircumcised people, and they're going into their house, and they're eating with them, like Peter did, and Peter's in trouble. The Lord's hand was with them and a great number of people believed and turned to the Lord. Hmm. Uncircumcised Gentiles. Here's a picture of Antioch today or in recent years. And that's the, the all these cities that, that are out in the desert like that have to have a river or something. And there's the river that makes Antioch, and this is why the king of Syria founded Antioch in this town. There was a river there, and that river led out to the sea. And so they had a connection with the sea down that river. And by the way, this is about 400 miles from Caesarea by sea. You talk about being scattered. It says they were scattered. Well, this is 400 miles from Caesarea, and that's not counting Jerusalem. There's a map of it as it was then according to archaeology and I don't need to go into all that but I, what I'm laying out to you is that you see down there in the corner how much 1,200 yards is? I mean it's not all that big of a place. It's still but the time you count in all the settlement around that place that had that water it was the third biggest city in the Roman Empire. There's a picture of it today, and there's the mountains back there. Um, it is a place where that river cuts between the mountains that come out of northern Syria and the ones that come out of Lebanon. And they come together, and that river in that town cuts its way through those mountains and separates this range into that range. The mountains of Lebanon, where the cedars of Lebanon were cut, that's on the right, and that may be it there, I'm not sure. Verse 22. News of this reached the church in Jerusalem. Oh my goodness. The fat's in the fire now. And so they sent Barnabas to Antioch. Well, the choice of Barnabas shows the power of the Holy Spirit because they did not send the right man up there to straighten them out and to ream them out and to bawl them out and to make accusations about uncircumcised Gentiles. They sent the wrong man. Why was that man called Barnabas? That's not even his name. That's the title they gave him, the son of consolation. They sent the son 
of consolation up there to sink that ship and instead he, he consolidated it. Let me read you. When he arrived, and he didn't make up his mind according to this before he saw it, it says he arrived and saw what the grace of God had done. What kind of a test do we want to put about the decisions that a church makes? Can we see the grace of God in it and what the grace of God has done? You better be able to find it. And he saw it. And he was glad. And he encouraged them. The son of encouragement has encouraged this bunch of foreigners, uncircumcised Greeks, and so forth. He encouraged them all, not just some. He encouraged the whole business, them all to remain true to the Lord with all their hearts. Now, I've tried to tell you, and I have difficulty with people understanding me what I'm trying to say, but this word true here is one of the two big words in the Old Testament that describes who God is. And we Greeks approach the scriptures different from a Jew. That's why I say that the, uh, Paul said the scriptures are for the, the, the gospel is for the Jew first. And the reason is because us Greeks have got a foreign background to the real doctrines in the Old Testament and we miss it all the time. What does this word true mean? Well, you ask it in a Sunday school class, I do it all the time. And they, and they always talk about the facts. That is not the nature of God. God is not a thing. A fact is a thing. And so if God is true, what does that mean? That means that God is true in relationship to his promises. He's true first to himself. And then he's true to his son. And the scriptures brings it out that the promises that God made to Jesus, he made them all good. And Jesus went through what he went because he knew that he could trust the promises his father gave him because God is true. And when John used two words to describe Jesus in the first chapter, what words did he use? He said he's full of grace and truth. And that is he's speaking to an understanding of the Greeks who need to know what truth is. And the only version we've got of it is when we ask a man, have you been true to your wife? And that's really what the nature of God is all about. God has given his word that he'll be true to his word and true to the promise he's made us. And that's why we can be saved is because that promise it's to all men, not just the Jews. It's to them first because they understood it and they had the background to understood it if they would. We know that some of them didn't, don't we? They're like us. How many of us out there, how many Americans have refused the gospel? How many in Little Rock have refused the gospel? I, don't, I, I, I wouldn't get into that. But at verse 24, he was a good man. How many, how many characters do we have in the Bible where that statement is made like that? Not many. I, I, don't, I haven't examined it to where I can give you a scholarly answer. But I do know that when the Bible says he was a good man, and this, he's good because he can see, and it says he saw what the grace of God had done. Well, you've got to be good to see that. And he was good. Full of the Holy Spirit and faith, and a great number of people were brought to the Lord. That's what happened at Antioch by the Holy Spirit and, and them sending the right man up there. What if it had been somebody else? What if it had been one of those people that wanted to hold Paul, uh, Peter's feet to the fire? What if it had been one of them? 
Acts 4.36. I'm dropping back to the fourth chapter now. Joseph, this is the beginning of, of Joseph or Barnabas. Joseph, a Levite from Cyprus, whom the apostles called Barnabas or Bar, Nabas. Bar means the son of. Barnabas, which means son of encouragement. Barnabas goes to Antioch probably by sea. It's quicker by the sea than it is by land. And he saw, or that is, he realized. He perceived it. Jesus had trouble being understood, and he said, those that have ears to hear, let them hear. And he also said, those that have eyes to see, let them see. What does this man got? It says that he perceived it. And it says he was a good man. And the result of that is what? Always is true in Acts. A great number of people are brought to the Lord. It says it every time. Then, oh boy, now, now we're really getting good. Then Barnabas went to Tarsus to look for Saul. And when he found him, he brought him to Antioch. How did Paul or Saul wind up as a missionary? Take a look at Barnabas and this Holy Spirit and you've got the answer. When he found him, he brought him to Antioch. So for a whole year, who? Barnabas and Saul partners met with the church and taught great numbers of people. What is the church supposed to do? What is the greatest part of the commandment that we've got in front of us? What was the commandment? Go and make disciples of all nations, baptize them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to observe all things I've commanded you, and I'll go with you to the end of the age. That's what we're supposed to do. And it says the first thing that Barnabas and Saul did was teach great numbers. That's the task that we had better get our mind on. We've lost too many generations now. Barnabas saved Saul from oblivion. Acts 9, 26. This is talking about when Saul was saved and he came back to Jerusalem. When he came to Jerusalem, he tried to join the disciples, but they were all afraid of him, not believing that he really was a disciple. But Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles. He told them how Saul on his journey had seen the Lord and that the Lord had spoken to him and how in Damascus, he had preached fearlessly in the name of the Lord, or in the name of Jesus it is. Well, Barnabas is one of those that could see and hear the work of the Holy Spirit and see it. So he goes to Barnabas, looking for Saul. What do you, what is that, what do you think that means? Nobody really knew where Saul was. And he had to go, and I'm sure that the Holy Spirit was in it, and he found him. And so he brought him back and they met with the church and talked for a whole year. Great numbers of people. And then here is this astounding statement. You see it, that last thing there? The disciples were called Christos first at Antioch. And we call them Christians. What does that mean? Well, I meant to cover all this in one night, and I'm not sure I can. I've got uh, another minute or two if y'all will give it to me. It's a new name, and it's a new and it's a new people, or is it the same Jews that Jesus found, and that and that the disciples were teaching in Jerusalem? Is this the same people? So who were they? What were they like? 
Were they like the Hebraic Jews in Jerusalem? They wouldn't even enter a man's house if he was uncircumcised? Were they the same as the Grecian Jews who would murder Stephen for talking about it even? I'm reminded of Acts 6 1. In those days when the number of disciples was increasing, the Hellenistic Jews among them complained against the Hebraic Jews, that's the apostles, because their widows were being overlooked in the daily distribution of food. Well, I've got more here, but I want to emphasize, and I'll close it down with this word. I have told you before that um, there's some outstanding things that we need to know about Acts. One is Acts was written by the only Gentile that wrote in the Bible. It was written by a man who was amongst them, especially with Paul and Saul the mission. It was also a man that was the only writer in the Bible that ended his writing with a word like this. And the word is unhindered. You remember me telling you that? Well, let me tell you. Let me read you about Philip and the Ethiopian. Then Philip opened his mouth and beginning at this scripture, and that's Isaiah, preached Jesus to him. Now as they went down the road, they came to some water. And the eunuch said to him, Now as they went down the road, they came to some water. And the eunuch said, See, here is water. What hinders me from being baptized? Well, the Jews said he can't be, uh, he can't be saved because his body's been mutilated and he's a eunuch. And Philip baptized that man because the gospel is not hindered by any rule that we make. That's why Luke said that Paul was in Rome even though locked up in a jail that he preached the gospel for two years unhindered. That's the significance of all this. And I wish I could have finished it all, but I came close, did I not? Let us pray. We thank you, our Father, for your message. And we ask that you give us your spirit out of the message. Help us to have the wisdom and the ears and the eyes to see and hear what you want us to see and hear. And be with us in this church as we make decisions. Help us to go forward in rightness. And we ask that you hold us up. For it's in Christ's name we ask it. Amen.